get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise in this Inspired Insider.com interview, what does rustic salad bowls, a natural food store that eventually sells to Whole Foods, an import business, bagel store that eventually sells to Einstein's, and a kosher Italian vegetarian restaurant have in common? Noah Alper, listen to this interview. He talks about the highs, the lows, the big mistakes, and the lessons learned. That and much more coming up now. Jeremy Weiss here. We're, we're here with Noah Alper, who founded Noah's Bagels in Berkeley, California. He started one store in 1989, built it up to a chain of 38 stores, which he sold to Einstein Brothers Bagels for $100 million in 1995. He's founded five other businesses, and he is the author of the business mensch, Timeless Wisdom for Today's Entrepreneur. Noah, thanks for being here. It's great to be with you, Jeremy. Just one minor clarification. It was actually 96 we oh, sold the business. 96. All right, thank you. Close, close <laughs> enough. Um, so, you know, Noah, we often learn our most valuable lessons when we make mistakes. So I'm really excited to hear your highs, lows, and especially some of the big lessons you learn from this, you know, the mistakes along your journey. And before we get started with some of the great stories you have, I always like to include a fun fact. Um, a fun fact about Noah which I had no idea. So he, when he was born, he didn't have a name for three months and he actually changed his name in 1988 because he always, what was your old name? My, I, I like to say my sort of slave name, like, like Kunta Kinte in Roots was a Norman Charles and I never really cared for it. And, and so uh, in 1998, um, I, Changed my name. To so, Noah. why did you not have a name for three months? Um, I, <laughs> I didn't have a name because my parents were having a debate about what my name should be. My father was in the food commodities business with his father, um, and this was in the 40s, and uh, they were just breaking into the supermarket industry. And uh, dad got the Skippy peanut butter line. Um, and it was a very exciting thing. And he, as a result, wanted to call me Skippy, um, uh, for which my mother uh, violently objected. You could thank and your mom for that, right? I thank my mom for that. And then the second name was after the founder of the Skippy Peanut Butter Company, Jerome Rosefield. And my mother didn't like Jerome either. And then it kind of, as I understand it, went back and forth. And I was referred to as the new baby. Uh, for three months, and then uh, finally they came up with Norman Charles, All right. and how they came up with it, I will never know. Well, I want us to get to, you know, basically Noah's Bagels and how you started that, but first, tell us early on, when you were a kid, what was, did you always have that entrepreneurial spirit? What was one of those first ventures you started? Yeah, I, I looking back at it, you know, when you, you get to a certain point in your life and you have enough history you can kind of look back and you can see patterns that, that, that develop that at the time, you know, don't, don't appear to be anything significant, but, uh, but they, uh, they later um, reveal themselves. And yeah, I mean, I just always liked sell, sell, buying and selling stuff, I guess you would say. So at a very early age, I guess sort of my first venture was a lemonade stand and I would have like, you know, I would even start them in like, in, I grew up in New England, so it was cold in the winter and snow and whatever. I can remember specifically putting my sign in a, in a snowbank because it was a, like a warm, you know, weekend day. And uh, um, I decided it was time to open my lemonade stand, regardless of the fact that it was March. And so, yeah, I always uh, enjoyed, you know, buying, selling and being in business. Did you get that from your parents or was that your own undertaking? I think it was a little bit of both. I mean, dad was in business, um, but didn't take too much of it home. You know, uh, when I grew up in the 50s, dad's pretty much, you know, worked long hours. They didn't talk too much about what they did. In fact, I didn't really know what he did exactly until I was well into high school. 
I knew it was something with food. I knew it was had something to do with advertising and sales, but I just really wasn't sure. But yet, you know, we would talk about various aspects of of, uh, of things over the dinner table. He would be dragging up cans of green beans and asking what size they were and julienne cut or straight cut in the size and so on. So there was a, you know, a constant sort of a business climate created. But I think that my entrepreneurial instincts were kind of self, self-grown. self So you've been around the food business for a while. So did you decide, Did you, were you always in business or did you decide to go to, to college? No, I, uh, no, I, no, I went, dad, I drew a lot of my inspiration from my father. Yeah. And he felt very strongly that a, that a broad liberal arts education really set one up for um, any, you know, any kind of career, be it business or anything else. And so I followed that lead and went and got the liberal arts, a bachelor's degree. So where did you go? So I started out at New York University and then transferred to the University of Wisconsin and, and graduated from the University of Wisconsin in 1969 with a BA in economics. So tell me, what was one of the experiences that sticks out to you in Madison? Well, when I <laughs> there were a lot, but when I went to Madison, it was a it was a crazy time. It was during the middle of the Vietnam War, and it, especially towards the end of my tenure there, um, trying to stop the the war was as significant a, 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 a endeavor as going to school. Um, as a matter of fact, there were so many protests and and so forth that oftentimes school was closed. Um, I, I, um, I, boy, there were so many incidents, but I, you know, I, I remember um, very, very clearly seeing friends of mine get into sort of really violent or semi-violent type behavior um, as a result of, the, of their anti-war efforts that uh, was really kind of shocking that, that you know, that that kind of, uh, um, that a situation can uh, can be so profound that it can basically change the way, fundamentally, the way people look at the world. Especially one friend in, in particular was very much of a pacifist kind of oriented guy, and I remember seeing him throw rocks at you know police cars. So, so wow. it got it got, got pretty rough. Got pretty rough during the the, the Vietnam War era. Yeah, and I. And I was part of it, and I'm proud of it. I, I think that uh, my dad always said, again, you know, referring back to him, that the sort of big party at times, if you will, in a certain way, is, is an important thing. And I uh, also, uh, um, all of us were subject to the draft, which is something we don't have now. And so that was, a, for sure, a, an important motivator as well in, in terms of getting involved. I remember listening to one of your talks, and you referenced like a psychiatric ward. What happened with that? Well, you know, yeah, the uh, the um, the times in Madison were crazy, and, and and there were a lot of drugs going on, and a lot of tension. Uh, we had National Guard on campus with bayonets. I can remember coming out of a um, storm tunnel uh, after uh, doing a reconnaissance mission. You know, considering cutting the phone lines of the university. I mean, it was a it was a serious serious time. And I uh, hope the FBI isn't listening in, and and decided that um, uh, you know I would be part of it, but it got to fundamentally got the whole thing got me crazy in, in a certain way, sort of too much drugs, too much excitement, too much uh, craziness, and I think also a sort of a sense of um, where am I going? Am I going to be a, uh, a revolutionary? Am I going to sell tuna fish and peanut butter like my father? You know, what am I going to do with my life? So it all kind of congealed at the end of uh, uh, my time in Madison, and it, it sort of uh, it sent me off the edge and sent me into a psychiatric institute, and I was there for uh, better part of nine months. Yeah, I mean, I think at that point of our lives, we could all kind of relate to what are we going to do, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. I guess it's just that... The we do, but I there was a lot of amplification for those those confused feelings yeah. vis a vis the war and the and the you know the sort of revolutionary climate that existed in those days, 
And also the, uh, the, the drugs were a catalyst, uh, for sure. So what was the next step in your journey, um, your entrepreneurial journey? What did you kind of start or sell next? Well, basically, you know, I got out of the hospital a little shaky and went to work for my brother-in-law, you know, in, in a bookstore and um, saw these, uh, these uh, salad bowls at, a, at a, uh, a friend's house. It was kind of a rustic wooden salad bowl that, that uh, I don't know why, but they just really turned me on as a, as a, as a means to, um, you know, to serve a salad in. It was at the time, some of your viewers have seen The Graduate. Right, and everything was with Dustin Hoffman. Everything was sun, plastics. You know, I mean, it was a whole time of of naturalness. Of everything was natural, and the, you know, so I saw these as a just a tremendous. Um, uh, I just got excited about these salad bowls. I don't know how to put it, but you, the grains of the, the the natural wood were beautiful. You put salad oil in them, and they they just shine. And I think the thing that got me most excited truth be told, Jeremy, was that what was shown to me was a second, okay? It wasn't first quality, it was a second. So it had a little nicks and flaws and whatever. As a result, the prices were extraordinarily cheap. And so what I saw in a certain way was beauty, value, and something that I felt would be in high demand because of the the kind of the the climate that, you know, the, the, the kind of the, what the style that people were interested in in those days. How do you test it? So did you start selling it or what, what did you do with well, it? Well, I wasn't, I wasn't very sophisticated. I mean, the, basically what I did was, um, uh, first of all, I was a young guy and second of, late, second of all, the business was, <laughs> was so much less sophisticated than it is now. You know, the notion of testing it is obviously now is so totally intuitive, but in those days, I just got, I had a VW bus, that was sort of, everybody had a VW bus in those days, and I got in the VW bus and I drove from Boston to Vermont, and I picked up a truckload of these bowls, and uh, on the way back I hit a blinding blizzard and uh, basically totaled out this VW bus, huh. um, rented a, uh, the largest Lincoln Continental made, because it's the only thing big enough to put the bowls into, I had like my life savings of about a thousand dollars full of salad bowls, brought them back to Cambridge, had an Indian bedspread, because that was like an accessory item for the VW bus, spread the, the Indian bedspread over the back of the trunk in Harvard Square at noon time, and uh, in an hour and a half all the salad bowls were gone. Wow. So I knew my first business was born. Wow. So in an hour and a half they were all gone? All gone. So what did you do it's next? Amazing. Did you... Did you go get more? Well, I, it's not it skills, but you can't keep did, with your bus. I'm sorry? I said it's hard to keep going back and forth with your with your bus. Well, that's you? basically what I did. Yeah. I got a, I got another truck, because <laughs> that one was uh, gonzo. And and uh, I would uh, would go up to to, uh, to Vermont and I would buy, you know, salad bowls and bring and bring them back. And and uh, had a sort of, by then, a kind of, uh, you know, a makeshift storage place and um, sold them out on the sidewalk. So what was a big lesson you learned from, from that business? Huh. Um, well, I, I think that it, it was take a, take a good pulse of the, of the, um, of demand and then take a risk and, and to your point, test it. I mean, in a certain way, that is what I did. Yeah. I, I, got, I got the bowls and put them out and tested them. But I, I think that maybe the lesson was a lot of people do it in sort of a theoretical way. Right. You know, a lot of phone intercepts and so forth and, and you know, and, 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 and focus groups and stuff like that, all of which is very important in business in, in terms of doing a sophisticated thorough job but there's really no substitute for just sort of putting the stuff out there right. and seeing who's gonna buy it, who's right. gonna lay down money for it. Right. That, that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. Yeah. I mean it sounds like it, that's exactly what you did, it was test it, I mean you didn't write a big plan, you didn't kind of figure out the market, you just bought them 
and you went and tried to sell them and you you saw there was I mean, demand. I see it as, yeah, I mean, I didn't see it as, okay, I'm looking for my next, you know, uh, business to start or career or whatever. I was still an employee of the bookstore. This right. was just kind of a, a sidebar. Right, right. So what was the next uh, business that you started? Well, so I continued on with these salad bowls for really was quite a, quite a bit of time. Uh, and uh, then, but then I started to branch out a bit and did some wholesale uh, activity with them as well. Would go around to stores and sell them on a wholesale mm -hmm. basis, um, and and was doing that. And then um, uh, my wife uh, at the time said um, she wanted to open up a natural food store, and I had sort of not so much interest in natural foods, but a lot of interest in these salad bowls and. Also, by then, accessory items, uh, boards and uh, uh, wooden implements, and so it was a whole sort of a wooden artisan-made uh, housewares line by then. And so I said, well, let's, you know, let's combine our ideas. We'll have natural foods on one side of the store, and we'll have the, the, these, these rustic wooden things on the other side. Um, it was at the, it was at a time too where there were these a lot lot of these sort of quasi hippie stores where there was sort of like everything you know everything from plants to to housewares to wooden toys to you name it and so it kind of fit in with you know with that kind of model and so that's what we did and the name of the store was Bread and Circus okay so it's from the Latin. If uh, any of your listeners are familiar with Latin, it's about the only expression I know in Latin, but it was, I don't know where I picked it up, but somewhere along the lines, Panet Circensis was uh, bread and circus in English, and it had to do with when the, when the during the Roman Empire, when they didn't have enough food to feed the peasants, they would bring the wandering troubadours in to take their minds off of their, 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 their travails. So that's basically how we got the name, and... Uh, and that business uh, got sold um, after about three years of operation because I, I just felt really confined in a in a retail environment. Knew it had to grow and expand and and get big, but um, didn't want to be the one to do it. Um, and, and sold that business, and then it, it the, the owner really blew it out uh, to the point where it became the largest natural food store um, operation in the Northeast. And it got sold basically at the same time that uh, a later business of mine, which we'll talk about, known as Bagels, got sold um, to Whole Foods Market. And it's, so now Bread and Circus is, has been incorporated in and is, is, are now Whole Foods Market stores. Yeah, I mean, so you were really onto something at that time. And you've yeah. ne you had never started a store. What was some of the big mistakes that you made or lessons you learned from that experience of opening a natural food store? Oh, uh, good, good point. Um, well, I, I learned a lot about, you know, dealing with fresh uh, material, the cheese and, and, and produce and so forth. Um, I learned how to stretch a dollar, uh, how to, how to um, uh, build a store for, you know, very, very little. Um, the sort of what it took to run a retail operation, the, the kind of a commitment, yeah. the, the psychic commitment, the, the, um, uh, the uh, physical commitment, the, 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 the risk. Um, and also, again, I think it the same lesson as with the, the salad bowls was um, it was the right business for that time. Natural Foods was about to take off. And we got in just a little bit early um, but it was clearly uh, we saw the business growing as it as it uh, uh, you know even in the two to three years we had the store. Mm -hmm. But I guess I also learned, um, although not I didn't learn this one too well, that I wasn't really a great operations guy. I was more of a startup guy because once the three years came, man, I was bored and ready to move on. Mm -hmm. um, and, and later in, in my later career. You know, we got people that were operations guys to do operations. Yeah. This is, of course, a tiny ma and pa, and there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, assistance. But uh, those are, uh, you know, amongst a few things. And, and I think dealing with customers and 
uh, would be maybe the last thing I would mention about that. You know, when you're dealing in the retail business, again, tremendous, tremendous way to 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 learn about human nature and buying patterns and uh, what it takes to satisfy people. Because when people come and purchase um, goods or services, they're usually bringing a lot of baggage with them, both positive and negative. And whatever it is, you, you, it's going to get thrown at you. And you better <laughs> and you and you better learn how to how to deal with it. So what was something that you remember got thrown at you at that time? Well, I remember we had people that would would have, um, they, they'd sort of hold meetings in the bulk bins of the, of the natural food store and feel very free to help themselves to samples as they were having their discussions and meetings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we had to sort of gently but firmly tell them, you know, in a, in a, in a polite and diplomatic way that this wasn't okay. And then the next week they'd show up again, and so you'd have to you have to kind of deal with that situation. And obviously, the store full of people, you've got to handle it well. Um, we, we would also be difficult customers uh, in, in other ways. I remember a guy who wanted an eighth of a pound of like f- five or six different cheeses, and he would always seem to come in at the most busy time of the of, of the of the week. And and you know, hey, he was giving us money. You know, this is what he wanted. We had to deal with it, right. you know. That was our perspective, you know. If someone came and it was five minutes to seven, and we were closing at seven, and they were, were, were leisurely about their shopping, well, you know what it is. It's we were there to serve, right? And that's and that's and that was that was the lesson that that I think we uh, we took into the business. And even despite the the challenges of uh, uh, of that philosophy, we stayed. We stayed with it. We were we were uh, servants, if you will. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's not easy to start a store in general, a retail store. And then you have goods and services. How is it uh, the dynamic with working with the spouse? Um, well, it was difficult, which is maybe why we got divorced eventually. Oh. <laughs> um, but but no, it's very difficult. And I and I and I think that that in retrospect, you know. It, creating some sort of mystery, some sort of you know a, alone time, separate time, having different endeavors, you know, is, is really really important. I mean, it you know we worked well, but it was the the confinement, in, especially in that kind of environment. If it was a larger environment where there could be much more separation of function, and one could be out on the road, and one could be you know inside, right. whatever. It's a lot easier. But as a general rule, I don't recommend it. Nor do I recommend. Right. Family and friends. It, it, although I've done done it all, and, and and some of it's worked very well, and some of it uh, has been problematic. Yeah, I could see it being it's tough enough, kind of starting it, and then it's under a stressful environment, and then you're with either a you know a spouse or a family member. It can get stressful, so to speak. For sure. I mean, the good news is, you know, there's the trust is there, and the and and, and you know who you're dealing with. Yeah. And that you know, and that's the good side of it. But it's it's highly problematic, and and I would you know strongly advise people considering it to 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 think it really through very well, right. and to try to con, you know construct some sort of contract, either verbal or or written, even that kind of spells out job functions and and sort of spells out. What happens when it gets, you know, starts to get bad? What are, what's the, what, what are the steps right. that we take? So, you know, after you sold the natural food store, what was the next uh, endeavor? So, um, you know, I, I, this is kind of a good segue because while, while the um, natural food store um, was in business, I continued to, to operate the wholesale uh, end of that oh. wooden uh, housewares business, um, smaller. I wasn't able to get out on the road as much and so forth, but I continued it on in the basement of the store. Um, and, and so when the store was sold, the plan was to blow that out, if you will. Uh, so, and that's basically what I did and, and, uh, uh, developed that, that wholesale, uh, you, it started out as Alper Wooden Bowl Company, and by the end, it became Alper International because we were buying stuff from all over the world, and it wasn't only woodenware; it was a lot of other things. But I, referencing back to the your previous comments about 
um, doing business with family and, and, and friends and so forth. So that business, I, I, I was involved with a friend um, who helped develop that business with me, uh, to really just tremendously at the beginning in terms of you know, going out and doing a sales function and basically opening up you know, uh, the whole country in, in, in terms of uh, opening up new accounts. It, it, it later developed that this the person took on a sales management role with the company. Um, because that was kind of the, 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 the understanding that if that worked out, the, the opening lots of, lots of new accounts, and that would be the, the next uh, step, and that, that person would be part owner in the company as well, and that's what we did. However, it, it, it didn't end well because, um, in, in my opinion, his strengths in the sales management area weren't strong enough to support what we needed and and I had to make a change and that was very very rough and, and it was a rough second only I'd say to my divorce in my really my whole life was having to make that make that break um, uh, so I sort of putting an exclamation point around the difficulty of working with family and friends yeah so I mean how do you even start to approach that because someone may be listening to me kind of at that point at the same stage now where they kind of know they need to make that break but it's it's hard to do how do you even begin to well I think I think the way you do it is you, you really have to separate out the business from your personal relationship yeah. you know and you have to you have to I always kind of felt like these businesses were my my children in some fashion and so it's sort of like, well, what does this child slash business need right now? Mm -hmm. Okay, because you know they don't survive on their own, <laughs> you know, and 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 it's and it's a dynamic process. They're they're you know they start off with a bang, and they you run into a bump in the road, and what are you going to do? You got to pivot. You got to do this that you know. So it's 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 a dynamic process, and and at any given time on that process. You have to have the right pieces of the of the of the equation, you know, uh, organized for it to, to, to prosper and, and, and move forward. And you just sometimes, I again I reference back my my dad who was so you know instrumental in his advice, but but he, he sort of referred to it as firepower, in the sense of you need to be able to fire someone. It's hard to do. Hard to do. Probably the hardest thing. I ever had to do in my business career was fire people, and I had to fire a lot of them. And and you know what? It, every person I fired, um, or in some fashion term, and I don't want to make your listeners think I was you know a uh, firing them every week, but you know things happen. Right. And yeah. at, at every at every given juncture when this would happen, I would always having get, got through with it, say you know what I did the right thing always. The only thing that I um, regretted uh, almost at every juncture was not having it done sooner, yeah. because it wasn't good for the company, and, and 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 furthermore, it wasn't good for the individual. Because more in more cases than not, than not, the individual kind of it did not come as much of a surprise yeah. when when it, when it when it when it had to happen. Yeah, I mean, does it does it make a difference too, like how the person handles it while you're talking to them? How did your friend? Handle it when you had to. Oh, well, like, that was not. That was one of the examples where it did not go well. Yeah. I think partially because we had such a close personal relationship, mm -hmm. um, and that's something that's also just sometimes unavoidable when you're involved with family or friends. But in an ideal world, you want to try to keep it, keep it separate. But but in this case, it was it was. Um, it was not possible, but I just had to, you know, tough it out. So what ended up happening with that business? Um, so that business, that business uh, got fairly big um, for the time. Uh, had sort of uh, maybe the better part of uh, eight to ten people working for me, and also had. Um, uh, commission-based sales representatives uh, in every region across the country um, developed it, uh, and about uh, 
you know, I have a kind of a seven year cycle, seems like, you know, like a sabbatical. Um, it got to the point where, you know, I'd sort of had enough. And uh, so actually sold the business and, um, and moved on. So after you sold it, then what do you do next? Okay, so after I sold it, I, I, uh, I had worked very hard at that business, and especially at the end, and uh, all the negotiations and the whole thing. So there's really a sense of relief that, that had been sold. And uh, I was ready for a little time off, and I decided to go on vacation. And I had, uh, was born Jewish, but not from much of a religious home. Um, but had this uh, sort of, uh, just on a whim, decided I would go to Israel as a vacation spot um, and went and uh, got very excited about it just from a sort of a cultural standpoint. I, a, uh, a, uh, for any of your Jewish listen, listeners uh, from the Kishkis, from the, the guts, you know, I just, uh, it, it, it spoke to me. It was as if I had gone home, although I had never lived there. The culture, the land, especially the land, it just it, it, it spoke to me is the only way I can put it. And so I, I, I decided that I was going to dedicate to the next chapter to developing a business that would have Israel as its centerpiece. Um, and so it was at the time when um, Ronald Reagan was in power and every... Uh, uh, Christian um, ethos was uh, far and near, and um, what, the statistic that I heard, um, again, referencing back to my sort of ability or um, perception of what's a, tr what's a current uh, cultural trend that maybe could be capitalized on in a, in a business sense, um, one out of three Americans had admitted to a born-again Christian conversion, was the statistic I heard. So at that point I decided there was a business of selling Israeli-made handicrafts and religious items to fundamentalist Christians in the United States. So that was the business. Um, started out foods from the Holy Land, it, uh, it, it changed into gifts from the Holy Land, it, there was some testing going on there. Um, eventually, it, 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 uh, I created a mail order catalog, and uh, it was a complete and total uh, failure. Really? Uh, it, it, uh, there was one day when I had four orders that came in, and I was like, yes, this thing is turning around. And then by the next day, I was like one every three weeks. And it, I, I realized that um, after having you know, a string of successes, that this was a failure, and that was very, very difficult to accept, both on a uh, personal level, a financial level, um, but it was time. I had to pull the plug, and so um, that's, I pulled the plug and looked for new opportunity. Uh, by this time, I had, uh, had um, two kids and a third on the way, and uh, the fun and games were over and it was time to make a living. And uh, so I looked in those days at newspapers for businesses to buy. I had never really uh, been employed per se, uh, except for my brother-in-law way back when. And so I went to a headhunter and he, uh, he uh, heard my story and basically told me I was unemployable. And um, that spurned me on even more to do something on my own, um, and, but I was not really finding anything until my brother um, came back from Montreal and uh, saw a bagel operation and he said you ought to do this in Berkeley, California where uh, I, I moved from Boston out to, out to California and, uh, and so I, uh, uh, I really was not sure about that at all because I had never you know, mechanical stuff was not for me. I, I sort of a fairly good amateur chef, but not baking because you had to measure. You know, that was not something I was very strong in in me in measuring and careful preparation and so forth. But I agreed to take a look at it because uh, sometimes we have older brothers or siblings or whatever that 
you know, you had been mentors for you and you, they know you and you know, you, what they say is significant and you know it's significant. Even if you're not gonna maybe take the advice, it's worth, yeah. you know, they know you as well. And so there were a lot of reasons why I felt it was probably a good idea to check this out. He had good judgment, he was a business school grad and so forth. And so I did that and I looked into that business for a year and at the end of the year decided that not only was it, um, um, there were not great bagels in Berkeley, which is the sort of the first motivation, but the second was that it was a growing national trend uh, to the point where I felt like it was becoming pizza, like pizza was in the, in the 50s when, when I was growing up and you had to go to Italian neighborhoods to, to get pizza. And then it became, you know, omnipresent. Well, the same thing was happening with bagels. So you had a national trend, very strong. You had a local demand. Um, I was able to come across a fantastic recipe and a methodology which I felt I could handle. Um, and then I went about getting a great location and uh, and started it up. And as dismal a failure as the Holy Land Gifts was. Uh, the Noah's Bagels was a rocket ship from day one. So how did you know there was a growing local trend for that? A national trend? Yeah, national trend, but then local demand. How did you know? Okay, well, the local demand I knew firsthand because, you know, I knew from a bagel and there was no great bagels. And yet, San Francisco was the gourmet capital of the world. And when I was in the housewares business, the first gourmet show was in San Francisco. So people in San Francisco knew from good food. There was great Indian, Chinese, Mexican, you know, seafood, you name it. There were not great bagels. Mm -hmm. So that I knew firsthand. The um, national trend piece, um, one of the, I think one of the keys to my success in business has been to try to learn from everybody. Yeah. And to try to fi sort of file these little factoids somewhere because eventually they can become very valuable. So what I learned, so the, where I learned this was from um, a bagel equipment dealer, okay? Part of this exploration of whether to do this business or not was to go and figure out whether I could accomplish the, the, the technological part of it. So I was shown equipment, so on and so on. I expressed concern and doubt that I could handle this stuff Guys, like, look, you know, we have people all over the place, you know, that have never been in business, and we have places, and you know, we're opening up, you know, got a place in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and this and that and the other, and started explaining to me how these bagel shops were sprouting up, and I'm like, boy, you know, if you, you can sell bagels in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in those days, when like the pizza in the '50s was previous to that, only in the Jewish ethnic pockets of the Northeast and in, some, in the Great Lakes area and, and, and all of a sudden, you know, it's booming. Well, why not San Francisco, which already had the, the demand from the gourmet high, you know, uh, upscale crowd. Right. So it was kind of, there. that's where it kind of melded. So when you decided to, okay, I'm going to get this bagel store going, how do you even decide where to put it? Is it like a certain, like, Location that you scout yeah, out, or what do you do? I think that the, the 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 way to start, you know, any kind of first of all, you know, anyone in business will tell you, you know, well, this is a little dated now with the internet, but I mean, location, 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 right? Most people have heard of that. So, you know, that's that's um, there are three locations in that statement. So it's you know, I mean, it's not only you know, for instance, we looked at height traffic areas that didn't have our customer there right okay so there's a lot of different components to it but what really what really struck me about this location was not only did it have a large jewish contingent because you know okay they were going to be our core customers they understood bagels in 1989 um number one number two we were in a in a um, stretch of, of retailing that there was tons of other specialty food places. So people that were going out and buying their you know organic groceries were also going to be interested in buying bagels because it was right there. Thirdly, um, this place had its own little parking lot, which was kind of unique in the area because it was a quite a quite an urban 
quite an urban location. So there were a number of different, different you know, factors that, that all sort of lined up, uh, not the least of which was we were close to the university, you know, and it was great, affordable uh, food that students uh, would glom onto as well. And so these, these various, uh, at, at that point, um, guesses, if you will, educated guesses, uh, you know, in that case turned out to be quite accurate. So, I mean, it sounds like from the very beginning, it was a big success, but I know there were, it wasn't always like that. What were some of the big mistakes or some of the low points in the journey? Well, the, uh, the divorce was a low point, it was a very low point, and uh, that, was, that was rough. Uh, then I um, had a had a, a um, kid as well, and then then um, my oldest son and his mother moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I was living in Boston, so that that not only was it sort of lonely being alone, but then my my son was away from me as well. So that was that was really quite challenging. Um, you know, in, in terms of the in terms of the the, the business per se, yeah. Uh, yeah. the the uh, the Holy Land uh, gifts thing was uh, was was really quite a low point because it it, it it tested my confidence and and you know that was I really you know uh, an entrepreneur or was I just a kind of a flash in the pan mm-hmm. um, and and could I do it again um, because. You know, uh, most businesses fail, uh, Jeremy, and I think that your your listeners know that. I mean, I, I, I emphasize that at every opportunity I can. I mean, sometimes they start off well, they plateau, they, they fall down. Sometimes they rise fast and fall down. Sometimes, like us, I mean, even, at, even with, with Noah's bagels at the end after developing this one store into 38 stores and having a, a, a thousand people uh, working for the company, um, we got uh, confronted with, with very substantive major competition that the company that wound up buying us before they bought us told us, if you don't sell it to us, we're going to open up from, across from every one of your stores wow. from, from, from Seattle to Los Angeles. And they were, uh, they had the money to do it. And, and you know, and, and we had virtually no competition all the way through. Um, so, you know, <laughs> that's what business is like. It's, it, it's, it's always a tentative proposition, even when it looks like it's, uh, you look at General Motors. I mean, that's kind of the archetypal example. Um, you sit on your heels and all of a sudden you get wiped out. Uh, so there's many ways to fail, and it's very difficult to succeed. Uh, so that's always a very, uh, you're always kind of, you, if you're not a little bit nervous all the time when you're in business for yourself, there's sort of something wrong. So what do you say to them when they confront you with that? And that's sort of well, an intimidating, we, in-your-face we, thing. We got together, Is it by then we had a team, and, and I would say that one of the lessons I've learned is that you know, these earlier businesses, they were kind of one-man bands, if you will. Right. And later on, you know, it was a large business and we had a quite a substantive team with a lot of different expertise. Right. Now, you know, even if you're a one-man band, quote-unquote, you know, you need all that expertise. And so if you bring it in as in a consultant, on a consultancy basis, or, you know, you have friends and family you can call, whatever it is, it's important to get that expertise in, in lots of different functional areas. Um, so uh, by then we had, you know, a, a great team and we sat together as a team and we said, you know, what do we do? Do we sell it to them? Don't we? And at the time, the, the offer was for stock. It wasn't a cash offer. And number one, we didn't feel the valuation was sufficient. Number two, we weren't that we weren't that um, uh, sure about the solidity of the company. They were growing extremely fast, and although they had a lot of capital, um, we just felt it was such a different model than the way we had 
built our business, which was sort of brick by brick, mm -hmm. um, that we weren't comfortable about taking back that paper. And turns out we were right because uh, uh, a, a year later they came back to us with a full cash offer for more money. Uh, and we took it. Um, but then, less than a year later, they, they went bankrupt. Wow. So if we had actually taken that paper, you know, we wouldn't have uh, come away with, we would have come away with 10 cents on the dollar. Wow. Eventually. So it was, uh, you know, but during that time, we had to sit down as a team and say, well, if we don't sell it to them now, can we take them on? And we looked around the room and we said, you know what, we can do it. And we planned, we, we made plans to, to roll out on a national basis at that point yeah. and to sort of uh, do battle, if you will. So it was a whole lot different than that, uh, that one store on College Avenue at that point. It was, you know, there were war maps up on the, you know, up on the board. And what about this territory? And it's our flank covered. And, you know, it got serious. Yeah. And a lot of people were involved. I mean, I wanted to say that from the get-go, that although we got a you know, very handsome price for that business, it was definitely not just me by any stretch of the imagination. My brother, I didn't mention, but came back and joined the business a year after it began and was absolutely instrumental in, in the success of the business because we had complementary skills. This going back to my previous point about about needing a whole set of skills to, you know, to, to make a business fly. Yeah, and you had another um, interesting partner as well, right? Well, yes, we had Starbucks. <laughs> Starbucks uh, at, at uh, a certain juncture when we needed more capital to, to, uh, uh, to fuel our growth, um, we were opening up sort of organically next to Starbucks stores because sort of bagels and coffee go together as you, you pointed out, why did you locate in certain areas? Mm -hmm. So we found ourselves, you know, our people were kind of getting to know their people just, oh, let's look for this location that's, you know, that works for both of us and so forth. So it got more and more formalized and then eventually it turned into an investment. Um, that was pretty close to the end of the, of the uh, you know, our to the sale of the business. It was a little uh, over a year before the business got sold uh, uh, finally, but it was a good partnership. So, were there any big mistakes that you think back on in the the Noah's Bagels days that that you remember? Because it seems like from the beginning it was like lines were out the door and it worked out perfectly. Was that the case? Yeah, no, that it, most most all of it worked out beautifully. Um, during the beginning stages of it, uh, I was running the factory, and that was pretty much of a disaster, because I was, you know, quite proficient in knowing how to sell the bagels, but making the bagels was another story, and and so I really have never been fantastic at personnel, and you know, sort of made some mistakes that could have been pretty disastrous, but turned out not to be. I think we dodged some bullets, to be quite honest. Um, I think sometimes uh, I would be a penny wise and pound foolish, uh, if you're familiar with that old time expression. Um, and, and, you know, being thrifty and economical is a good thing, but sometimes you gotta, you know, put it out and, and some, to, you know, borrow money, but hire the best people you can, you know, you can find. And that, mm -hmm. that kind of lesson was taught to me by the, the, the staff that we brought in. And so, you know, yeah, we have to go into a little bit of debt, but, you know, we're going to get a first class team here because we've got the resources to take it very far. I left to, left to my own devices. I, I, would, I would have had three or four stores and that would have been it. I wasn't, you know, I, I, getting that big was very scary for me. I, yeah. you know, I, I, entrepreneurs are a lot less the risk averse than some people would make them out to be, and and I for sure was. But once comfortable with the team, then was comfortable about going very far. Got it. So, what was life like after the sale? 
Well, after the sale, I sort of I sort of fulfilled a dream, which was to go back to to Israel, specifically to Jerusalem, and learn everything I could about uh, um, um, Jewish learning and education and and text study that I never had as a kid. And so I spent a year in a yeshiva, which is a a Jewish higher learning institution, if you will, and and uh, learned a fair amount and got got a good background that I took back with me and and uh, and it was a wonderful, really wonderful time. And I, I got I got back off the from our trip and almost immediately was tapped to help found a Jewish high school. Hmm. So I in, in San Francisco area. So I I mean I knew a lot about starting businesses, but pretty much nothing about starting schools, but. All of my businesses have been kind of learning on the job endeavors anyway, and I, I think that's part of what I enjoy about it is just kind of going off the deep end and figuring out how to swim, so to speak. So, um, but this one was way more challenging really than any business that I, I, I took on because, you know, the whole um, buy-in uh, notion and constituencies and endless discussions and process and so forth was not stuff that I was, you know, either number one good at or number two had the patience for. Um, and diplomacy and all the things that I, am you know, would say were not my strengths, I needed to learn if this thing was going to succeed. And I think there was a, I am a pragmatic person, so I rose to the occasion, I got as diplomatic as I could. Um, and we put together a you know a team, and we developed, We opened the school in uh, uh, it was uh, ten days before 9/11. Wow. So that first year was definitely challenging to to uh, to try to sell a Jewish school to uh, you know a community that was uh, totally frightened about the physical safety. Right. Not to mention who sends a kid to a brand new school, high school. You know, you have to be a little, either a little crazy or, you know, a risk taker or whatever. So it was, it was a challenge. And, um, but the school now has 175 students. It's in its 11th year. And uh, we're about to b- build a gymnasium. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a very thrilling endeavor, really, in a certain way. More thrilling than, than the Noah's endeavor, even though, of course, it was a nonprofit and I was a a full-time volunteer for the better part of four years. Yeah, yeah, you're affecting a lot of lives. Did you yeah. start another business in concurrent with that, or after that? Uh, after, yeah, it's sort of somewhat concurrent with that. Um, Noah's was, amongst other things, the largest kosher retailer in the United States. So there was a lot of people from the from the kosher end of the world that were very uh, indebted to us for having that resource. And on a local level, um, there was a lot of demand to open up uh, some other kosher venue. And so my wife and I decided to uh, open up a, uh, a kosher restaurant in downtown Berkeley. And that was um, something between a sideways endeavor and a failure. <laughs> Um, so it was, uh, that was a, it was a kind of a long, long four years of running that business. And eventually we, 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 um, we were able to sell it, uh, and get out. Um, and it, it had taught a lot of lessons in humility and it was, a, it was a, it was a fun, exciting endeavor. We, we served, a, we served a, a, an adoring crowd. We had fabulous food. Um, made some mistakes. I think location was not right. Uh, you're never adverse to making mistakes, even though you've had tremendous success. And right. I think some entrepreneurs don't get that, and they go in and they think whatever they're going to do is going to replicate previous success as well. Every endeavor is a new endeavor, and uh, and so I've I've, I've um, um, we were able to, as I mentioned, sell the restaurant, and now I've gone into um, business advising, yeah. and that's that's what my current endeavor is, and I'm just enjoying it thoroughly, working with with young entrepreneurs, with startups, with businesses in transition, and um, trying to you know 
impart some of the lessons I've learned over the, the course of my 40 years in business to, uh, to people on their way up. So what's um, an interesting story from consulting that people have asked you? You don't have to name the company, but what's something like an interesting problem or story that uh, you have from the consulting side? Well, there was one one incident in particular that I that I recalled, which I think speaks to um, a, a sort of a timeless um, quality to to interaction and specifically to sales that it, it can sometimes be lost on a mon- on a modern sensibility. The example is, I was talking to a company that was. Um, had a high tech application, and they were, uh, you know, to abbreviate the story, they they were they were meeting with an extremely important partner, uh, with with which they were intending to build their business, and uh, to to sort of convince that partner that this was you know that this was the direction they wanted to take, and so I said, well, how, it was fundamentally a you know a sales presentation, and I. I said, well, how, you know, what's the logistics? How is it going to be set up? I said, well, we got a, you know, we got a conference call scheduled for, uh, you know, a week from Tuesday. And I said, um, that doesn't sound right. I said, there's something that's important. Get your rear ends in a plane. Go to where the partner is. It wasn't that far away. First of all, sit down to a nice lunch. Get to know them. Get to get to, to to feel comfortable with them, and then ease your way into the meeting after lunch, and you'll be on a, about a thousand percent better footing to to make this thing work than you will on a on a cold, uh, you know. Uh, not to Jeremy for a minute. Put down. We love Skype. You know, Skype is the you know it's wonderful for sure. But no, but there's something about that in person. You can't you don't have the same connection. I know what you mean. Yes, it wasn't only that they were weren't even going to go with a Skype. They were going to do a call. Oh. I mean, high tech guys. What did they? You know, it was very efficient, right? right what right. do you need to see people for? You know, we can just <laughs> you give them the spiel. They get it. You know, no, come on. You know, so I I think that you know that kind of thing is. Um, is how I think you know I, I can add value. Is that I've I've been around and I've been in a lot of different you know venues, buying, selling businesses, product, uh, marketing, you know, scoping people out and situations. And so I you know I have some uh, you know some some I think some valuable um, expertise to offer to the world, and uh, that's what I'm doing on a day to day basis and enjoying it very much. Yeah. So, I have uh, one last question, but before I ask it, I wanted to have you talk a little bit about what you're working on now, what you're most excited about. Um, my day-to-day life of fielding calls from entrepreneurs across the country and across the world and being able to, you know, steer them in a direction that um, is positive for them. In some cases, uh, <clears throat> quite truthfully, I'm I'm uh, acting as a sounding board and telling people this is not a great idea, and they've had questions about it and, and concerns, and they sort of need someone. They they oftentimes people know what the right answer is, but they sort of need someone else to tell them, um, and and you know that gives me great gratification being able to. To provide to provide that function. So, if people have questions for you, they want to find you. Where are the best places to contact you or find you? Okay, so um, uh, noahalperconsulting.com. N o a a shoot n o a h a l p e r consulting.com. Okay, so definitely check that out. And right. my last question for you, Noah, is. You've been your your dad was in the food business. You've been in the food business. Are your children in the food business? Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that. Uh, before I get to the food business, there was one other thing I wanted to mention, which is that I actually wrote a book as well called Business Mensch. Yes. Timeless wisdom for today's entrepreneur. I have to if I'm a marketing guy, if I don't plug myself, you know, what's uh, there's something wrong. Um, so that's businessmensch.net. People could check that out. I'll link the that up. To your, yeah. To answer your question, um, 
in, in my oldest uh, boy is actually uh, not a boy anymore. Um, the one who moved with his mother is now 36 years old and is living in Israel, uh, married an Israeli woman and has actually made Aliyah, he's moved. Um, and he's starting his own um, uh, natural foods uh, catering business, already prepared meals uh, uh, delivery business. My middle son is just started, this is all happening exactly at this time, it's really coincidental. Middle son um, has been in the real estate business for the last couple of years, but he's going into, um, he's going to be starting business school in the fall, and he's very interested in beef jerky. So he okay. wants to get, you know, business school training and he's seriously into curry and every type of description of beef jerky that you ever heard of, he's, he's experimented with. Um, and the third one is, is working for a food company, just started that job and is now in New York um, and it will be East Coast representative of this company uh so the answer is two out of three and probably the and probably yes. the third well hopefully they go to noah noah com and hire you for, for business <laughs> i would hope so <laughs> the price is right yes. but Noah, thank you so much i really appreciate your time and your expertise thanks Jeremy, anytime i look forward to hearing from from your listeners and i wish you all I'll bet the best success with uh, with your endeavor, which I think is very exciting. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye now. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 